to give this talk. Thank you very much for this introduction. And uh, thank you to for Carnegie Mellon to, in, uh, to invite me here. Somewhere the light comes out. Yes. Uh, this is the plan of my presentation. I'm going to say just a few words about Plymouth University. Uh, describe the, the problem I try to solve. Uh, describe model architecture, neuron model, learning rule, some simulations which we could manage to make work, and give some conclusions. So Plymouth University is, let's take a picture from above Central Park in Plymouth. Um, this is the north, this is the south. So if you take a boat and go due south, you, uh, 100 miles later, you are in France. Um, station is here, the, the university is here. It's about 10 minutes walk from the sea. The town center is here. My house is somewhere here. It takes, takes me 10 minutes by bicycle to go to the university. And uh, we have 20, uh, Plymouth is the, the, the biggest city in the south of England. It's on the south, southwest of England, bottom left, if that makes sense. Uh, it's famous to some, to, to some American people because there's a boat which left Plymouth called, uh, was it the Mayflower or so which? Anyway, the, the so we have 27,000 students. Uh, we had the first robotics undergraduate the, 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 the degree in, in, in the UK. We have an MSc Robotics since 2005. Uh, since this year, we'll be able to have a joint MSc Robotics Technology with Carnegie Mellon. So we take students in the first year in Plymouth and the second year in uh, here. We have highly rated research in computational neuroscience and cognitive robotics. This is an iCub robot, which is built, built in Italy. And this robot learns to recognize colored balls, which is something very important in cognitive robotics. Uh, we have an active, we are quite active in human <coughs> robot co competitions. We, we recently won a cham championship in Taiwan and we are current world record holder in sprint and, and marathon. So f f for one year I can boast about that. So here's the, here's the problem I, I try to, to solve. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a, a, a short test with you. And here, here, here is the task. In this square will appear a capital letter A or a capital letter B. And if it's A, you raise your right hand, okay? If it's B, you raise your left hand. Uh, you are ready for, for that? Okay. And the question is, how much time did it take you to decide that you were ready? Huh? How much time? One, one second? Maybe two? So in that short time, you programmed your brain. You, you, you create a link between the representation of the letter A and the link of the, the, the motor part which deals with, with moving your, your arm. This is, this is a very, very fast, fast, fast learning. And uh, how do, do, do we do that? So the, how did you think that, that, that you did it right now? Most, most people, they, they visualize A, right arm, B, left arm. They, they create pictures in their brain of the stimulus and the action. So that, that's something that Venus Williams, a tennis player, she, she explains she, she did that to, to prepare for a, a return or serve. If the ball comes here, I'm doing that. If the ball comes here, I'm doing that. So she, she prepared in her brain a stimulus response system such that she doesn't have to think about it when it happens. It's already ready. The, the, the link is already done. So what are the data about this, this process? And there are surprisingly little data. For years, psychologists have used program subjects. Sit in front of the screen. When you see this happen, reply here and so on. They, 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 they never 
we're worried about how, to, how, how you program people by, by speaking to them. It's, it's very strange. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible uh, capabilities. Uh, when you do experiments with, with, with monkeys, you have to train them during months because they, they have to guess what the task is. If you do it with people, you just tell them. However, there's a, there's a recent ex, ex, experiment which, which was published in, in 2010. There's a, there's, a, there's a German group. He, um, he, he, he put, uh, they put people in an fMRI scanner and showed them stimulus and response to say, if you see that picture, respond with the right hand. If you see that picture, respond with the left hand. And they, they tested people when, when they, they did the, the actions, so that they showed the r repeatedly uh, the different stimulus. And what they, they observe is that there are some areas, so, so, uh, so for each rep rep repetition of the stimulus response, they observe that some area had an activity which went down, and some areas had an activity which went, went up. So, it looks like these, air, these blue areas are programming areas. At the beginning, you, you program the, the brain, and then the, it is the, the, the practice itself which, which, which gets training data. So they also observed uh, that during practice, the response time went, went down. So, so it went down b by about 50 milliseconds. Uh, that's, that's the number of practice, which is eight. So it, it, it takes very little training. And they also observed that the accuracy when uh, the, 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 the number of mistakes they made went down from 4% to about 1.5%. So from the first execution, people are very precise. So you tell them that they do it right straight away. Huh? So the way I understand that is learning probably takes place around the, the dorsal route from the vision part to the motor part. And the instructions through a, a visualization of the stimulus and the response creates an activity in the visual part and creates an activity in the, in the dorsal part. So that's 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 a seed for for training, and seed does does help learning along the, this path, but when you do practice, practice practice itself is a seed because you see the stimulus, and you you produce the the, the, the response. So your response and the stimulus will keep keep the system training. That's that's the the, the, the way. Uh, understand the, 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 this experiment and uh, it's, an, it's an interesting paper. So there are open questions like is my interpretation right? Is that the, the, the right route which is used? That there's a guy called Simon Thorpe who was very interested in fast, fast responses and he, he drew this picture which is a different route here from the, the visual cortex to the motor cortex. Uh, who is right? I have no idea. He's, he's probably right. But anyway. And there's areas which, uh, here you have an area which I have no idea what it does. And, it, and its activity also goes up with, with practice. So my model is probably incom is, is definitely incomplete. And the main question for this talk is what are the mechanisms which, which allow such fast training? And that's, that's what I'm going to try to answer during this, this presentation. So the, the way I specify the problem is we have probably the in instruction coming in, into the auditory part of your brain. There's a mapping from instructions to the visual input so that you can visualize the, the stimulus. There's a mapping from auditory part to the motor part which, which allows you to visualize the action and the bit which we are interested in is that mapping here from visual to, 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 to motor input. And I model that 
as a multi-layer system. Huh? So th the way I understand learning is, is finding a path from this layer to this layer, find, find, find the route through these different layers, which links that stimulus to that response. And it's not, it's not simp simp simply a, a telephone switchbox task, because you cannot just link this neuron with this, this neuron here. You want that this path needs to be stimulus specific, because only when you show this combination here that you activate this, this neuron here. So it's sort of a pattern recognition task. Huh? And there is no interference with, uh, with existing stimulus responses. By learning this task, you don't forget everything you did in the past, which excludes architectures like multilayer percent perceptuals and half field approaches. Because with, with these two, you need to show the lots of stimulus responses many times until the system learns the lot. And it's one-shot learning. You show it once. And which ex ex excludes again the these approaches. So there is there is the question: How how can we do that? that there is no existing model for that that kind of learning. Yes. Is it um, strictly speaking, one shot learning, like in all three of our trials that uh, kids are taught, like if I say this, then do that. You know how to associate stimulus with responses, sure. But the, the which stimulus, which response, that, that you don't know. That it, huh? So, so I, the, this, the same test I could have done with, if you see a green horse, you wiggle your, your right toe, you cannot say that there's a link there in advance. Huh? But what I assume is that there is lots of connections here which, which don't, don't, don't do anything. Huh? So, so the question is, how can you find a route through the existing ones? Huh? So the way I, I'm going to do the learning is th this is the, the, one of the, the key ideas of this model, is that you have the top layer, which is the motor layer, which says, I want to be activated. So it defines a, a, a cone of attraction, in a sense. So it says, what, whatever you are doing, go through here in such a way that when you finish here, you are in, in the right place to activate the, the, the response. So it's... Huh? And at the same time, there's a rep representation push, which is this stimulus wants to, to be represented here, and then this layer wants to be representing the previous one, uh, and so on. And so, and so this push is quite... It's not that directional, but this cone is restricting the guys who can learn to being inside this cone, such a way that when it's over, it's, it's here, okay? So that, that's the, the key idea. So from the biological point, point of view, the, the question of how is this call for activity done, I sort of think that in the cortex, you, 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 you have the, the, this layer, two, three, and five, six, and two, three, the, the input goes into two, three, and goes to the next layer, two, two three, and so on. And, but there, there's also lots of f feedback connections in the brain from into layer five, six. And these feed feedbacks go to the next layer five, six. So th uh, they, they, there's like a double stream, a feed forward stream and a feedback stream. My assumption is that the, the, the feedback stream somehow primes the feed forward stream to do the learning. So information that goes back here tells all these guys, you should be learning what's going to, to, to happen, uh, whatever it is. That's an assumption. I'm not going to say more about that. There's a, a, a paper on my website which uh, sort of elaborates a bit, bit more on that. So what we try to, uh, to achieve is, is a system like, like that, is a, is a multi-layer system where you, you present the stimulus and there are links <coughs> which are created between neurons in successive layers so, such that 
When this stimulus is presented, this right hand uh, that does respond. Huh? So how do you validate this model? Is it possible with electrons to nail down specific neurons like monkeys that you can follow the path if these neurons get activated? Is this possible nowadays or not? This? Do we have the precision of really heading down to one neuron? Um, well, the, the it's hard to know in advance which neurons are going to do the job. Um, so the architecture is a seven layer architecture with a response. Uh, each, each layer is 10 by 10. So th this is just shown from, from the sides. And each neuron has input from five by five neurons in the, the previous layer. And that's it. So it's the design in such a way that this last layer can get information from the far corner of the this neuron in this corner can get information from neuron in this corner through a cascade of, of connections. So you're sure that whatever neuron is here can rep 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 represent the whole stimulus. It's just a geometrical constraint. So the question, one question is what neuron, neuron model are we using in this, uh, this model? And we are, we are using a spiky neuron model, which is, which is essentially a leaky integrated fine neuron with some complications. So you have an input neuron which makes spikes. You have a probabilistic synapse, which means these spikes go through or do not go, go, go through, which is what what is known in the brain. <coughs> the spikes that go through generate an alpha function, which is a current extended in, in time. Uh, this is multiplied by weight, which defines the amplitude of that. And then you, you have a synaptic de depression. I'm going to, to speak, speak more about that. And this is, there's, a number of, there's a number of inputs from a number of neurons. And they charge the capacitance here, which represents the, the, the soma. Uh, have a resistance which represents a leak uh, for from the soma. And then there's a firing threshold. So when the potential reaches the threshold, you make spikes. I also added a sus sustained Poisson firing, which is that as soon as this neuron starts firing, actually he switches to a mode where it fires, 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 fires. And uh, uh, it, it could represent some local, def the effect of some local def uh, f feedback circuit, but it, it, it's mainly important to, because, because in a multi-layer system, the, the firing rate tends to drop. So in successive layer, neurons fire at a lower and lower, lower, lower rate. It means at some point, the, the information doesn't go, go through anymore. So I'm using a, a trick to boost that, that activity so that in each layer, neuron fires fire at the same rate. Uh, we can debate if that's a good idea or not. So synaptic depression, what's so, what's so interesting about it? Uh, you do you know what synaptic de depression is? Um, well, sy synapses, when the spike comes from, from one neuron, they have the, these vesicles full of neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter is released in the synaptic cleft. That's the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. And these, uh, these neurotransmitter open channels so that ions flow into the cell. So the, the in in increase in membrane potential is actually due to ion flowing in. It's not due to the, the, the spike coming. And uh, all, all the drugs people take affect this, this process here. Right? Now, these vesicles, they get used. So once, once a, the first, the first electric uh, potential increase is, is very huge, but the, the second one is smaller because there's, there's less vesicles left. It takes some time for the vesicle to recover. So that is described by a, a recovery time constant. So if, success, if, if there's a big distance between two spikes, the, the, the vesicles have a time to recover more and the next, next spike is a high spike again, okay? And uh, the behavior is very interesting because if you have the sum at the membrane time constant, which is equal to the 
depression recovery time constant, the potential here stays stable. Whatever input frequency, you always get to the same potential. It's a very, very nice property. If the dip so <coughs> I say here that you, you reach the stable level very quickly. You, you go up in a, I don't know what the time scale is, 100 milliseconds, so in, a, in five milliseconds, you are there. And now if the depression recovery time constant is very short, it means you, you replenish the reservoir uh, very quickly, you have this, this b behavior here, which the, the, the memory potential keeps, 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 keeps climbing all the time. So um, now there's another, uh, which is the integration cont continues for a long time. So when you reach the, the stable potential, it has taken us quite a, some time. If the, de if the depression time constant is long, then the, the current which comes in is not sufficient to, to keep the potential up. So that the potential actually decays after the initial peak. And means if you, if you haven't managed to get the past, past the threshold here, you probably have, have no chance for, for, for it to, to happen here. So you, you now, this, this, prop this condition here is, is really interesting because you can have a nice and controlled pattern recognition with that. I'm going to show here an example where you have one neuron, three inputs. Each, each weight is a third of some, some value. And so you have these three neurons start firing at different times. So the first, first neuron fires, the potential goes up here. The second neuron starts, the potential goes up here. The third neuron starts, the potential goes up here, and the neuron starts, starts firing. So by, by picking these weights, you, you, you can make a pattern recognition which, which, which is quite, um, quite finely tuned. Because if you put this weight a bit too low, this guy is never going to reach the, the firing threshold. If you put it too high, it will already fire with, with two, two inputs. It doesn't need three inputs. So th this is very cool, and it keeps a kind of binary view of neurons, because neurons fire or don't fire. If they fire, you reach that, that level. So this neuron is really decoding how many inputs are there. It says, if three inputs are firing, I fire. It doesn't care what, what firing rate they have, but it need, need, need to be three. Right? So, um, and basically, you, you have to set the weight uh, to some value divided by m, where m is the number of inputs you, you want to detect. That's it. So it's, does that feel too simple? And enjoy it while, you, while it's simple, okay? <laughs> so the next problem is how can you, during learning, achieve the, these, these sort of weights? Now, if, if you use a heavy end learning rule, where you need pre and post, post inactivity, it, you have a problem because in this system, the, most neurons don't have either pre or post, post in, all, ne all neurons don't have either pre or post, post inactivity because these neurons fire because you do the, the visualization of the stimulus. These fire because you do the visualization of the target, the action. But this guy doesn't have doesn't fire and this guy doesn't fire. So these neurons cannot train the weights from here to here because they, 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 there's no postsynaptic activity. These guys cannot train because they, they, there's no presynaptic activity. Now there's another kind of rule which doesn't, doesn't require firing. They just uh, to require the postsynaptic membrane to, 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 to be above a given threshold. And so if you're above the, this potential, then uh, you can learn. The, the, the weight can increase when input spikes come. The problem is when you stop, all people who use this sort of model, they put an artificial maximum weight and minimum weight. Just say the weight will, 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 will rise until at some level. And Do we know what this, uh, this update is or this model is minimizing? Like for the Hegelian group, the second part of it is the gradient of a cost function, and we know, you know, we were minimizing for this one. Do you have any idea of what is being minimized? Or just.
No, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other, the other question is how, how fast do you change, change the weights? Which is, you don't think about that when you, when you before you start writing a simulation. <coughs> but this, this, is a le le this is a learning rate. So it means each, each time you see a, sp a spike comes, you, in you increase the, the weight by a cert certain amount. And at some point, it reaches the value you sort of hopefully uh, is the right one. Now, in this model, wh which I described, the, the, the weights are some value divided by m. So, so the weight is either this, one or one half, or one third, or one fourth, and so on. If the right weight is, if you have, if the number input is 15, for instance, you want to increase the weight until it reaches 115, and you want to do it slowly so that it doesn't reach 116 or 114, and so you want to, to, want to stop in the right place. Now, if the right weight is one half, you need to keep increasing by small steps until it reaches one half. It takes ages. Means, depending on the number of inputs, the, the, the speed of learning varies greatly b between neurons. So th 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 this is not something we, we want if you're interested in fast, fast learning. You want guys to, to, to learn. Huh? So basically, I think there's no learning rule that produces the, the, uh, the, the desired weight. And I did lots of trying, testing, and changing. And uh, at the end of the day, I decided, forget incremental learning. Just say, we will set the weight directly to, to the value which we, we want, which is say just. <laughs> and the problem is, how does the synapse know that value m? One synapse receives inputs. How does it know it should? This is one of 15 inputs, because the synapse only knows knows local information. Huh? So the solution is to use a concept of weight resource limitation. So each time an input comes, it claims resources from a pool, and hopefully uh, they they, uh, they end up having the the the, the 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 right weights each of them. So this shows you how this, there's actually a, a paper, little cited paper, where people made measurements and, and they saw that when one synapse increases weight, uh, the neighboring synapses decrease their, their weight. And uh, so they, they, are, they support that, that concept of uh, limited total synaptic resources. So how does learning work in that case? We assume there's a pool, so the there's a reservoir of synaptic weight. The first input comes, it will call a fraction, eta, from that, that pool. So that, that's the, 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 the new weight. There's less, less uh, weight left in the pool. When the second spike comes, it will take again that fraction from what is left in the pool, but also it will take fraction of this weight here. So, so this, this guy will release weight for this synapse here. And so, it, so it, the, the, the way it works, this guy knocks on the door, say, give me weight. So, so this guy has to give weight. And how does he know what amount to, to give? And this f formula tells you how much he gives. That's each synapse loses that amount of weight. Um, so that this f with this formula, you end up with two, uh, two weights being, being equal and being of the, the right value. Huh? And this only depends on, the, on local information. So it depends on the, the current weight, the, the pool, and the current weight. And this, this stabilization term, uh, again, depends on the current weight and on the existing weight of the, the calling synapse. And if, if we assume that the existing weight uh, does produce an EPSP, then it, uh, this information is broadcast to the whole, whole cell. So it, all this information is available to that synapse, basically. So this, this is an example with five inputs. This one neuron has five inputs. They all start firing at the same time. They have an input of 50 hertz. Uh, they cap 
Each input takes 0.8 of the, the, the pool at the start, and the pool has a value of 5. So at the end, you would expect all to have a weight of 1. Huh? So that's the story. Here you have uh, this line. Here is the content of the pool. And this line is the weight of the first synapse. So when a spike comes from the first input, the weight goes up to 4, which is 0.8 of, of the pool. When the second spike comes, this weight go, goes down. The pool goes down even further. And this weight go, goes up. When the third spike comes, the weight goes up. So, 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 so each, each, each time one of the, the, these inputs generates a spike, it, it distributes more and more the weights. And here, after 100 milliseconds, you, you can see that the, all the weights have got the, 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 the right value. And the fact that it happens at different times, because these are Poisson spike trains, you don't know when they are firing. Huh? You start a neuron that doesn't, make it's, doesn't mean it's going to fire now. It just the, the probability go, goes up, but sometime it happens. Huh? So the good news is that the, the rule works. It means that the, 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 the mathematics is done properly. Um, when did we start? We have around 20 minutes. Okay. So I'm not going to tell more about the maths now, but I'm happy to answer later about that. And a, just a small note, um, there have been many long-term potentiation experiments with, with um, when they, they stimulate a real, real, real synapse. And they, they observed that the percent increase in weight has this relation to, 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 uh, to the initial weight. Now, with my formula, it turns out that the final weight is independent of the initial weight. The final weight depends on the number of inputs. So you find that the, the fin final weight is a function of 1 over the initial weight, which is exactly what this function does. Huh? Uh, a short problem uh, is th the input spike makes a call, say, I want to wait. Now, at what time of this alpha function does the weight become effective? And you would normally ask, there's some time for the weight transport between the one synapse to, to, to the other. So, so, so I have no good idea of that. And I, I tried various times. and. One is at the peak, so that is three milliseconds after the production of the spike. So I assume there's one millisecond pro propagation time between the two, two neurons. Then there's one millisecond to reach the peak. So a uh, two is actually the peak, yeah. Three is slightly late and so on. So if you start to make the new weight effective late, this spike doesn't do anything. You have to wait for the next spike before the, the, the new weight becomes effective in, in terms of increasing the, the potential of the neuron. Um, so that adds about, that means that sort of curve, whatever, whatever the, the, the number of active inputs, it takes about 60, 70 milliseconds for the neuron to start firing. Uh, if you start early, it can be really quick, can, be, can take about 5 milliseconds. So you start firing seven, five milliseconds later, the, 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 the neuron fires. And we, we are going to see in the simulation later that this, this makes a difference. Um, so the first experiment I'm going to show you is that experiment similar to that neuroscience uh, uh, paper. You, you show the A, and you have to, with, with the stimulus A, you have to produce a response with the right hand. B, also the right hand. C, left hand, and D, the left hand. So I'm going to, to show you a simulation of how, how this works. It's, it's, uh, it's done on an atom processor. So I know it's done on the, the, the machine in there. So ooh, it may be quick, actually. Because uh, on this machine, it runs, runs really slowly. So we'll see how fast your machine is. 
So I have this. So let's set it in demo mode. Learn. So the first thing that you do is to decide what, what's the head, head of your corner attraction. That's, that's the stimulus, the, the response. You pick a neuron here, which is covering as many neurons here. And these white blocks represent the neurons which are enabled for learning. This is, this is not a network. This is just a display. Uh, the, the network is here. So yeah, so I press the key. And what happened? Press pressed the wrong key on the wrong machine, sorry. <laughs> so that's the letter A, which starts firing. And you have learning taking place between these neurons and these neurons here. And slowly, you see neurons being uh, uh, recruited. These red spots means which are the, the neurons recruited for the job. Huh? And once these fire, then it moves, uh, moves on to the next layer. This graph here shows the number of neurons recruited in each layer. This is a uh, one millisecond, I think. With one or half, half, this is, no, no, no this is 50, 50 milliseconds. Are you saying the number of layers? The minimum number of layers? Well, I picked the number of layers so that one neuron here can see the, the, the whole of the, this area here. It somehow matches all, almost the number of layers on the dorsal stream, but ish. So at some point, this, this guy becomes activated. OK, now uh, what happens next? So this showed the, the, the train tree. So you have this neuron, which activates all these guys, and is activated by the, this, this group of neurons. And now I'm doing something which is called pruning. I, I remove all the connection, the neurons which are not useful for the job. Uh, I'm uh, going to ex ex explain later how the later how the pruning works. So here you see the the connection which is left. That's these are the the connections which each neuron here is very specific to a different uh, certain c uh, combination of input patterns here. Huh? So then we move to, uh, out this is just showing how it works in, in real life. We just, uh, so here you see uh, the recognition time, the response time is 134 milliseconds and 284 milliseconds for the training. So now I, I move to the next pattern. I hesitate a bit uh, letting you see all that because it's, the whole thing is a bit slow. But did you understand the concept, how it works, huh? OK. Press escape. Yeah. So this, this is just a, a static picture in, in the case we, we couldn't have solved this. This is, this is the problem. So. Uh, pruning, what is pruning? See, in, in phase one, you recruit lots of neurons. Basically, each, if that's a stimulus, each neuron in the target, which has at least one direct link, will become activated. This, the, the thickness of the line is, represents the size of the weight. If this guy has only one input, this weight is the whole pool of weight is here. If this guy has two inputs, you have one, one half of the weights here. This guy is three, three is input, so he, he, its weight is one third of the pool of, of weights. Uh, okay? Now, which neuron 
is the most useful in here? The, the most useful one is the guy which represents three inputs. Huh? This is the, the most, this is the guy which represents most of the, of the stimulus. So I'm pruning away all the, all from these three connections out of this one, I keep only the smallest one. I kill all the strong connections and keep the small ones. So you end up with all the strong connections being gone and you are left only with these, th these three ones. So, so you do that for each, each layer and this massive tree becomes a very, very compact tree. And uh, this is a form of com competitive learning. I mean, com com competitive learning does that. But uh, some people think about lateral connections being really the, the way uh, lateral inhibition does competition, which means you would never create these connections in the first place. It's actually not true, because uh, ph ph physiologically, lat lateral connections are very slow. They're, they're much slower than feedback connection, for instance, which means that in practice you, you, you would create all, all these weights and would have to k kill them, the, 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 them, them later. So that's, that's a discussion uh, we could have about this, this implementation of larger projection. So now I did, I tried to replicate this data where you repeat the same stimulus several times uh, and the, ac the activity in the, the brain increases, huh? and the response time goes down. So, we have various co 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 conditions. You have to stay calm, hmm? okay? So, here we have the full lines are the reaction times, means the response time. Huh? You present the stimulus, and sometime later the, 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 the hand go goes up. After various training runs, and the dotted line is the, no, I'm, sell, I'm selling stupid things. Uh, th this line is the number of neurons recruited in layer one. And this line is, is the response time. So in, in this example, you can see that the, as you train repeatedly the same stimulus response association, the number of neurons recruited goes up while the response time goes down. So th this looks very much like, like what your, th these, these, these brain scans. And it does it about in the same time, time scale. Now, what, what are the con conditions here? Here we have probabilistic synapses for this case and implementation at time plus two, which means at the peak of the alpha function. Which means very early, very early implementation of the, the new weight. Here we have a pro firing prob a transmission probability of, of one, so these synapses don't, don't lose spikes. And either late implementation plus five or early imp imp implementation plus two. And you can see that uh, with uh, early implementation you also have a number of, an increase in number, but the response time says Stays, stays low and flat. Um, somehow with non-probable, with de deterministic synapse, the fact of having more paths doesn't make a difference. They sort of, they, they all work at the same, same, same speed. While with probabilistic synapse, the fact of having more paths there's, there's always one which is faster than, than the others. So it, in terms of, of this, this distribution of speeds, the distribution becomes wider, uh, which, which, which creates more and more short, short, short routes. I mean, it's, it's a statistical thing. Uh, um, could try to explain or try to understand better, actually. So, uh, what does that tell us? I mean, this is a mode which, which is really random. You, you create connections and uh, you, you have various paths. Sometimes this one is used, sometimes this one is used. And 
that, that, that's, that's the kind of network which is created in this, this case here. You have many more connections that, than you actually need uh, to do the task. And it, it gives an idea, it gives a view of biological learning as, as the doing, doing that. You sort of have a fast implementation, you rush through the system, you create too many links, that doesn't matter. It is, it is the, the fast, fast, fastest way of doing things. And uh, possibly you tidy up during sleep. You, you sort of do consolidation and remove connections which are not necessary and so on. Th th this is very speculative. Um, so con con as a conclusion, basically I have developed and tested an algorithm for learning in deep networks of spiky neurons means with, with lots of layers, and I think there has there is none none like that. Huh? So that's probably the first first net first learning route for that sort of system. If you have a better idea, please, it's good. And I have implemented some some new concepts so that the pull push principle of learning, you sort of call for activity and then the other side pushes for activity and both, both meet in the right place. And uh, the concept of setting the synaptic weights by a call for uh, some, some limited resource, that, that's, that's actually, that's also a new concept in, in that context of fast, fast learning. Yeah? It has been used in the concept of uh, the uh, uh, development of res receptive field in the cortex, and but it's, but it's a different approach, I think. And the benefit of that, there's no more problem with the, 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 with the, the, the diversions of weight. How do you normalize the weights? You don't need to do that. It all works automatically for you. And. I, I've been following a binary view of the uh, neural code, really but, but counts is a, is a neuron firing. And my stimulus are binary too, and my response are binary too. So without telling you, I pushed, pushed you towards that sort of, <laughs> that sort of thinking about the, 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 the code in the brain. To some extent, it makes sense, because you, you do an action or you don't do it. You don't do half an action, huh? like something like that. I mean, uh, anyway. Um, so the findings is that, that the resource limitation concept of the synaptic weight, that that's naturally the, the, the develops pattern recognition neurons. Uh, system noise is, is, in, is, in, is interesting. I mean, the, there is noise in the system, and it leads to sort of redundant paths. Uh, is it bi 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 biological? Uh, there's a s it's worth looking at that, I think. Uh, not so sure. Um, and also, pruning is actually what determines the shape of the network at the end. It's, it's not, 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 not learning. Learning just creates lots of connections. It's the pruning which makes the, the lean and mean uh, uh, network at the end. And so, so I didn't know that when I started, but, but it means that com competitive mechanisms, they are actually the, the, the ones which shape, shape, shape the network. So it's you have to be careful looking at that, I think. With, with the pruning, you, like, you go back to the network and say, this way is this problem, this problem, this way is this problem, this problem, this problem. Could you use, um, like when a neuron spikes after receiving a, a presynaptic spike, it releases a neuron buffer back to the right, which kind of feeds the, the most effective neurons. Could you kind of start out with the evaluation? It's a difficult one b because um, you, you need to have all the connections made before knowing which, which one is the more, most efficient one. Um, but but the, 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 this is an open field, I think. Uh, and there's many questions, which I have, but I'm going to let you ask, ask the questions now. Um, so thank you. Okay.
So <coughs> at the beginning, you were uh, saying like the architectures like multi-layer perceptrons were not feasible for bunch of learning because they need a lot of training data. So I'm more of a machine learning person, and I, I don't get much from the biologically inspired architectures. So what, as a machine learning person, what can we learn from biologically inspired system in terms of numerical algorithms that allow us to learn from these cases that we have? And we have many times very high dimensional data. We have very few training samples. We need to do this one shot. What can we learn? I think that, that the, 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 the issue is the rep representation. In, in uh, these, these spi spiky neurons, they, they could, if I take away synaptic depression, they become like, like standard uh, MLP neurons, including the bias, which, which means that the output frequency is some weighted product of the input frequency. And, and that's to, to generate the output, you need the right combinations of all the activities, and this, this is kind of a distributed representation. And I think if you use that, you, when you learn some, something new, you mess up the distributed rep rep representation. You, you, can't, you can use, cannot use that rep representation. While this, this network is actually doing an AND function. Because this neuron at the end, he fires if this and this and this and this is in the right place. So it's really an AND tree. So a and big AND function done, done in multiple layers. And that, that there, are, there are issues of capacity because you, you use the connection for one tree, you don't use them for another one. I mean, you use them if, if, if there are shared, shared features in the stimulus. Uh, so if, 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 if in the lower layer you, you, you already have a neuron which represents a certain feature, this neuron will also be activated by the new, new stimulus. And it's going to be used for the next tree, so it's not not like we don't want to, to use it anymore. So it's distributed versus localized rep representation, I think. Although I, I'm sort of, I, I sort of dream that maybe there's a distributed representation where you can make a change without losing all the rest. I, I haven't, um, I'm sort of dream this might, might be possible, but it's a more, few more time to work on that. So if I have a, I'm not, not that sure. Yes. I think that there's something in between with, which we, we haven't looked at, yeah. Um, so you had, turned on your presentation, you had this mapping between auditory and visual, visual mm. motor, auditory. I mean, it, it's very like, I mean, you could give some of the text for you, give them the instructions. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You probably show them a picture of an A and somebody raised the right hand, a picture of a B and somebody like This is actually how the experiments are done in the, 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 the brain scan machine. Yeah. Right. So do you think that instead of direct mappings between you know, visual or auditory and motor areas, there's probably something like mirror cells going on that are getting activated, and they in turn are doing their own cones of activity through the network that kind of potentiate the, the endpoints? And then Say again. Well, instead of, um, you know, if you see an A, then right the right hand shooting off signals to visual section to, act, to, you know, to activate the A area and the motor area to activate the razor right hand area and then that produces the cone of actor. Yeah, yeah. It's a kind of an intermediary mapping of, of sort of conceptual representations that could activate their own cones of learning in the visual cortex and in the, the motor cortex that then allows them to find back I still haven't got it. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the this. Wh where are we here? Yeah. I mean, the, this picture here, 
do you are saying training this bit or having different connections to, 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 to this part here? Uh, yeah, sort of we're doing three one-to-one mappings. And then have a block Ah, I mean, uh, I'm I'm very open to that. Uh, I mean, the, the when you say we, we should need to 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 look at data because there are data when when people read a text with objects and actions, you see the visual cortex becoming ac activated and you see the motor cortex be becoming activated just by, by reading a text to with these things, not, not part of an instruction. So um, it, it probably activates other areas which, which we, we, we haven't really looked at uh, properly. So I mean, the, the, the you, you, you need a switchboard somewhere which, 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 which creates links. Thank you.